today is about perception and how to find it. And first, I want to talk briefly about what it is. What is perception exactly? And there was a, a gentleman who posted a note on the message board for this workshop, and um, he said something about, well, perception is, you know, the, the creator or the, the people on the crew and the people on the set. And the only way to ever experience their perception is by being in their heads. And he's not wrong. We're going we're gonna to slowly start unpacking this. But when I responded to him, I said, well, what you're talking about is someone else's perception. And today we're going to talk about how to find our own, each of our own. We all have our own. And one way to talk about it, and I'm going to be very basic with it today. And in the future, if we do another one, I could get a little bit more advanced with it. But um, because once you, you dis discover where your perception is, you can also discover where it's located in your body. And sometimes it's not actually in your eyeballs. It might be coming from next to it or in your back of your head. Or... It's a little too much to get into today. But basically, there are three basic points of perception in general in the world. And one of them is the self perception. It's the, it's the position where you are sitting and it's your body, it's your eyes, it's what you're looking at, and uh, that's it. That, that's the only thing. It, that's one viewpoint. Another part of perception is the other person. So the second general part of perception, for those of you who are just joining us, I just started. So uh, you haven't missed too much. And I'm also recording this uh, via video that I'm going to put on my website later on, either today or tomorrow. So you haven't missed all that much. But welcome. Welcome with us. Um, so the second part of perception is the other person's perception, their point of view. So if you could imagine yourself sitting at a table with someone and I'm sitting here and this is my self perception, my self viewpoint, the other person sitting opposite me has their own viewpoint. And I just call it the other person, the other perception. Yet there's a third perception that exists, which I call the observer, which is if you're the person standing over here looking at both of us. Um, I did a workshop once where, uh, when I learned about this the first time, uh, if you've ever had an argument with someone or you're ever in a disagreement with someone and you sort of walk yourself through each step, each uh, position of perception, you actually realize that there is no argument, that it's just different viewpoints. And it's pretty fascinating. So, you know, you sit in your shoes and you, you know, whatever, and then you get up and you go over there and you look at yourself and the other person as, as if you're an observer. And then you go and you sit down and you pretend you're in the other person's viewpoint looking at you, right? And then you go back to observer and back into yourself and you sort of like just take in all that information. It's pretty interesting. But those are the three basic points of view that we could define as the basic principles of perception. Your self position, the other position, and the observer. Now, it is a fact that no two people on earth see the same thing the same way. Even when they have agreed upon seeing it the same way, they don't actually see it the same way. So if I... Well, let's say we're in a, a convention center, which isn't going to happen anytime soon. But let's just say you, you can imagine in your mind uh, being in a room and watching somebody speak at a podium. And you're sitting there and you're seeing them from this, your own point of view. The person sitting next to you, whose viewpoint is relatively similar to yours, is off by about, you know, a foot and a half, two feet. So there will be a difference in perspective that they have that you cannot have, even though you're sitting right next to each other. Now, imagine if you're sitting in the back of the room, how differently the room would look 
how, how much smaller the person at the podium would appear. Or if you're in the front row, how less of the room you would see and how much more of the person speaking at the podium you would see. Um, you might even be able to see them and their facial expressions a lot clearer than if you were sitting in the middle or in the back. So <clears throat> even if everybody has gathered there with the similar viewpoint, you know, let's say it's uh, the voters have come together to agree for this candidate or whatever. So they're all there as a basis for this person. But even then, every single person in that room has their own individual viewpoint and their own, perspe her, their own perspective of what's going on, what are they seeing, wh why are they there, the meanings behind what brought them there. Um, everybody's story is unique and different in that way. Any situation that comes up in, in life, whether it's a positive one or a negative one, no two people see the same thing the same way. And that's really, really helpful to just realize in general. Um, somebody once argued with me that when you're in virtual reality, uh, you are forced to see someone else's perception. And while they're kind of on the right track, it's still not the case because I have my own set of historical events in the past, my own background, my own uh, how I was raised, where I was raised, what were my surroundings, um, the environment by which I became an adult. Those things inform the way that I take meaning into my life. So even if you've designed a VR experience and I'm putting on the helmet and, and the goggles or whatever to walk through this VR experience that someone else has designed um, or the film that they've filmed in VR, even if I'm doing that, I'm still coming at it from my history and my viewpoint. So uh, there was a video installation, I think it was in New York, could have been in London, I don't know, it's been a while since I've traveled, but it was a, a fairly violent uh, street crime. And you put the VR on and you're a passerby, you're just somebody standing on the sidewalk and you're watching this horrible thing happen. And it looks totally realistic. I have no idea how they filmed it at all. Um, but it was really, really disturbing. Now, I'm not a, a, a big uh, slasher or fan of uh, horror gore. I like psychological horror and I like um, thriller and, and suspense type horror. I like Hitchcock, those types of like, you know, sort of classic horror. but. As far as like blood and guts go and like the, the gruesomeness of it, I'm not a huge fan. So when I'm experiencing this, I think it's a miserable experience. It's terrible. I don't even, I don't even want to keep those goggles on anymore. Somebody else who might really enjoy uh, the gore or the violence or whatever it is, they would have had a totally different experience even though we were looking at exactly the same thing. So when I, when I first talked about, you know, no two people see the same thing the same way, it's not necessarily just based on where you're sitting in relationship to whatever else you're looking at, but it also has to do with everything that has led up to where you are today, where you grew up, how you were raised, your environment, um, the culture that was around you. All those things are elements which make up your perception. Um, the next part I want to talk about is, uh, so we're looking at this thing, whatever it is. Do we really know what we're looking at? Are we really aware of what it is that we're seeing? Typically, most often, when, when we're watching something or listening to something, uh, taking in a new song or a new movie or reading a book or any sort of artistic endeavor, especially, or trying out a new meal or going to uh, whatever the, the thing is, typically there comes uh, a lot of judgment with that experience. Um, there's a, oh, I really didn't like it. Or I, I really uh, would have done this. You know, oh, if, if it would have been my film, I would have taken this ending or... Um, well, I wish they would have had this, this, and this. 
Um, and I very rarely experience someone saying to me, uh, describing just what it is, not necessarily what it isn't. And I don't know how our culture has sort of grew into that, but I think that typically when we're experiencing something, we very rarely take into consideration what it is that we're experiencing. Most often we're experiencing or we're, we're focused on what's not happening, what we're not seeing. And by doing that, you miss the whole thing. You miss the whole, I, you, the whole experience. So I started practicing this. And at, at first it was kind of, uh, it's hard to do. I mean, even just a little bit ago when I was discussing the virtual reality exhibit at the museum, I described it as something dreadful for me. But I also know what it was. I did see what it was. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, but when I, I very rarely hear someone come up to me and describe to me what it is that they see or what they've heard. And so I, I started trying to do that. I would watch a movie and I would accept it. I would just watch the film and accept it for what it is. You know, they, this was the story. That was the music they used. These were the characters. The, this is what the characters did. Um, when I started doing that, I realized there was no such thing as bad acting. There was no such thing as bad writing. There only is what is. So I just started watching movies in that way and I thought, you know, this is a totally different experience. By really just letting it be, it opens up the whole experience in a different way. It's very fascinating. And then you can walk away and you'd be like, well, okay, I feel like I, I didn't get much out of it. Fine, you did, maybe you didn't need to, you know, maybe that wasn't the point. Um, sometimes you could walk away feeling really inspired or really, you know, um, I mean, when I just, because I grew up on Star Wars and, uh, I, when I hear the force theme song, it goes up and it like, I can feel the force rising through me somehow. Like it's like totally just tapped in there. Um, but in, in absence of those types of emotions, you know, even if you walk away from a movie that you've really enjoyed, it wasn't like it was made by accident. There were choices along the way, every step of the way in that person's production of that record or that song or that movie or the decision of where to open that restaurant and what's on the menu. There were so many steps involved where decisions were made consciously that by the time you are seeing it or experiencing it or tasting it or whatever, uh, it's not like they just threw it together yesterday. So there's no reason that you should have any notes or feedback or, uh, I mean, you can, there's nothing wrong with it. There's no such thing as good, bad, right, wrong. You can, you can have them, but there's, there's no reason. You don't need to waste your time on it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, let it be what it is. You know, Showgirls was critically panned because it wasn't X, Y, Z. But if you, if you watch it and it's an, if you like telenovela or you like super melodramatic ridiculousness, uh, watch it and it's really great. You know, the camera works phenomenal. You know, the acting is all totally over the top and ridiculous. And it's, it's no different than loving, you know, a telenovela, which sometimes can be enjoyable to watch, <laughs> you know, just because it's a little ridiculous. Um, so that's... Um, the first part, we're going to get into the second part in a second, but first, before we do, I would like to have an exercise and those of you who want to respond afterwards, please do, because, uh, if, if at least two of you respond after we do the, the little exercise, then my point should be made. And if it's not, you'll know internally what I'm going for. So what I'd like you all to do is you can close your eyes if you want. Um, if you're pretty visual, you don't need to because you sort of can always just look up and see things. But what I'd like you to do, I'm gonna read a sentence to you, a couple of sentences. And I want you to imagine in your head 
what it is you're, like, I want you to envision what I'm saying, okay? All right. A man and woman walk in and set down the briefcase. The envelope is removed and carefully opened. Now, my first question, does everybody have an image of that? I'm going to read it one more time. A man and a woman walk in and set down the briefcase. The envelope is removed and carefully opened. So, does everybody have uh, an image in their head? Does it, uh, and once you do, what I'd like to ask if somebody's willing to answer is, who was carrying the briefcase in your vision? For me, it was the woman. All right. Um, who took out the envelope? A, a different person. It was a third party. Cool. Did anybody else have the man carrying the briefcase? I did. Cool. All right, so you get the point, which is you're both right. Mm -hmm. There is no wrong way to interpret that. Right. And uh, that's going to lead us into what I learned in that class called scene analysis, which was one of the only beneficial reasons I went to film school. Um, me, would you mind if I said something about this really yes. quick? So with the perception, I, I came to this understanding and it's through a lot of the coaching that I did um, through traumatic events and people, we, we begin to resonate with characters, right? So we have this deep feeling of characters on screen. And so we kind of become entangled with that character and we start seeing the movie from that point of view, right? And so you can take a really horrible movie and someone can watch it. And I've never had experiences that relate to that character who they're just not going to grasp the story whatsoever, right? But someone who's lived through an experience, rather it's like the character on screen or the people who made the movie, because every movie is based off of life experience, right? And so yeah. we throw all of our information into these characters and then our audience starts relating, like, oh, I relate to this. And so we all have these different views. And so I stopped rating movies. I stopped giving reviews and everything because you cannot, <laughs> I think it's unfair for people to rate movies and to give negative reviews just because it's not something that they like. And so I really appreciate it that you said that because it's just because you don't like it doesn't mean that someone else, it's just like people, we're all going to have different perceptions of people based on our interactions with them. And to just go off of, oh, well, someone else didn't like this movie, so I'm not going to either. I just think it's completely unfair. Totally. And you know what? There was, in my first movie, there was a character who spoke a certain way and acted a certain way. And this person actually behaved that way in real life, right? That was, <laughs> that was just their normal, everyday being. And somebody said, oh, God, that actor was terrible. And I'm like what are you saying? He's a terrible person because that's exactly how he is at home. Like, <laughs> you know, right? Um, it's so fascinating, but that's great that, I mean, I think that the more and more people that talk about this and especially in any kind of coaching situation become more and more aware of things like this. Mm -hmm. And um, that helps us all evolve, you know, as people and filmmakers, especially. Yeah. So thank you. for um, that. Thank you for adding that for sure. Um, okay. So, in this class, we studied primarily Hitchcock, although maybe there was a Bunuel, and I always just say Kubrick, Lynch, Fellini, I just, because those are the guys that I just went to mostly when I was learning, um, or just, they were, they were the ones who inspired me the most, I think, out of everybody. Tarkovsky, some, but not so much in, until like the later years. Um, and what, the, the, what we were supposed to do is dissect and analyze I think we started with just a scene or a sequence. I was asked to go and do the entire film on, on one of them. And it was very exciting, but it took a long time. But for the class, I think we were like, okay, watch this scene and then do like an overhead floor plan. You know, map out like, what does that room look like? Make a floor plan and then do an overview 
where the camera is positioned, you know, in that shot, you look at the shot and where's the camera, where are the people in this, in the shot and draw them on a piece of paper. And then if the camera dolly is like this, you make the little V and you have two little lines like a dolly track and you show, you know, <clears throat> shot one, part A, part B, you know, and, and you just, you analyzed every single thing in that scene or sequence. And when we were done, what we realized, well, what I realized, I don't think this was part of the lesson. I think the, the lesson was just trying to get us to think about uh, planning our shots so that when we got onto the set, we weren't trying to do it then. We had already done it, and so we would be prepared when we would show up to shoot something. That's what I think it, it was meant to do. But what it did for me was I realized that none of these guys were telling the best stories. And none of them were using the best shots all the time. Some of them were compositionally gorgeous, um, but sometimes it wasn't necessarily the best anything. So then I started to wonder, you know, like, well, that's a really weird angle, you know, or, um, or let's take David Lynch as an example. Nine out of 10 people who watch his movies don't understand a thing they're watching. Yet they hold him, they put him up here on this pedestal. Um, why is that? And I, I will tell you the answer in a second, but um, it's, it's interesting once you dissect it all and you realize that what they're doing isn't any different than everybody else, except that there is an underlying unity that you could come to the conclusion is what I did, that that is their individual perception. And by that, I mean, they weren't looking to their DPs and editors, schools, churches, neighbors to ask, where should I put the camera? You know, they did what we did with the exercise and they looked inside their mind. They envisioned the scene and however it played out for them is what they drew on the paper which then they put up on the screen. And they didn't second guess that. They, they weren't making those images of the woman in the briefcase and then saying, oh, well, maybe I should have the guy hold it. Or maybe I should have the, you know, somebody else come in with it. Or maybe somebody, no, they just, that was what they saw. And that was the image that came inside their own head. And that was the image they used. That was what they went with. Because my hunch is that out of a lot of filmmakers, many of them have very good, strong egos. Um, but typically there's always sort of a, I, I see it. I see second guessing happening a lot. And I think that that's opening the door and inviting something that, that is very dangerous. Um, because if once you start second guessing yourself, once you start, start allowing doubt to enter into the, your process of envisioning something, then you risk the, well, you risk losing your own true, unique individual perception. You become the other person's perception or uh, whatever it is. That's what I think uh, is why those guys are so revered because their sense of their own unique perception was so defined for them that you can probably watch any sequence, even if you haven't seen the film, and know exactly who directed that. If you're familiar with their other work. If you're not familiar and you just watch something, you might think, oh, this is really, I'm pulled into it, but you may not know. But if you've seen every Kubrick film and you have not yet seen The Killing, which was his second movie, um, you'll know instantly. You could, you could turn on The Killing and be like, God, I feel like this is a Kubrick movie. And then look it up and find out, oh, it is. You know, like, it's, it's one of those things that I think is pretty interesting. So my advice is to always just be totally true to you. Now, the only time when that is problematic is if you are hired by a producer or a production company who have their ideas, their perception of what the project should be. 
Now, in that case, I believe that the role of director is as a translator to what the producers see. When I'm producing something that I've written and I'm in charge of, if it's a totally true independent film and I've gone to raise the money and I, I'm in charge of it, then I don't have to answer to anybody else. I just I can go right inside those images in my mind and do them as I see them. But if I have a job and I show up on set and my job is director today for this production company and they want me to do X, Y, Z, it might be totally different than the image in my head. But what I need to do is as a sort of translator is use my skills and my gift to give them what they want. So in that case, I have to respect the other person's perspective and their perception and not let mine interfere. I can use part of it as, as I mention my gifts in, well, I'm going to try to frame it perfectly to communicate what they want as opposed to what I want, right? And if I do that as well as I can, then they'll be happy and the, the picture will be a solid image, like it'll be a beautiful movie. Um, in the case where they want you to do something that not only doesn't fit in your vision, but also doesn't fit in your laws of the universe, what I always say is, uh, instead of arguing with them, because they're the boss, I say, I think that's a mistake, but I'm happy to do what you want. And then I feel okay about it. And if they are, 80% of the time, they're smart. And they say, when they hear the word mistake, of course, they don't want to make a mistake. So they immediately ask, well, wait, 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 tell me more. Why do you think it's a mistake? Then you can explain. And if they still decide to make the mistake or do whatever they want to do, then fine, you just do whatever they want to do. But you, you give them that, you know, just simply, I think that's a mistake, but I'm happy to do what you want. And it just keeps it flowing really nicely on set and everybody's happy um, most often. So individual perception, we're gonna go back to that. How to make this, the, the stuff that's true to you. Um, and the only way to do that really is to, like the exercise earlier where we just envisioned it in our mind and that's the truth. How we see something is how we see it, period. It can be clouded by lots of things, you know, the way we were raised, our state of mind at the time, the people who are around us, relationships, all these things. Those can cloud how we see something, but if we're seeing it, we're the one seeing it, not somebody else. Um, that is a very dangerous thing. Individual perception is very dangerous to the power structure in our world because it takes away their power of control over everybody. Um, and I don't want to get conspiracy theory with this, but I'm going to just briefly say there is a reason why individual perception is not taught in school. And it's not encouraged at church. And the reason is if, if you taught that there wasn't a group perception or if there, you know, if, if you're, if you're, if you admit that and you open up the world into everybody has their own viewpoint, it would make grading papers or evaluating uh, students, it would change it. It would completely make that obsolete because the, the instructor's way, his perception isn't always going to be the case. Because no two people on the earth see the same thing the same way. So if that student, you know, if you say, okay, everybody, let's paint a blue tree. And all the students are painting trees and this kid paints a red one. Well, first of all, what if he's colorblind? I guess it would be red, green, colorblind. But I guess maybe there could be a red, blue, colorblind. Anyway, you don't know this. So if you give, oh, that's a fail, you know, Billy, I'm sorry, you painted a red tree, not a blue one. Well, what if uh, the other possible situation could be that uh, the kid hates blue, but red's his favorite color. 
and it makes him really peaceful when he sees something that's red and he gets angry and agitated and has anxiety when he sees things that are blue so why would he want to paint a blue tree he he will paint a red tree because that's just what's true to him and if he's punished for that I mean, that's just the first step, and then the rest of his life is, you know, really challenging. And I feel like we've all grown up in a culture that does exactly that. That says, basically, you can't have your point of view. You have to have my point of view. And my father gave me this advice one time. Um, I'm very fortunate and very thankful that I had the parents that I had, because I was taught stuff like this when I was growing up. Um, there are three common ways people see and exist in the world. One is I see the world and I have my sets of values and beliefs and you should have those same beliefs. That's the first person. The second type is I have my values and beliefs and you have your values and beliefs. And then there's a third type of which is the person who's on the reverse of the, the first one, which is, um, well, you have all the answers and your beliefs and I'll just do whatever you say. You know, I'll have, I'll take on your beliefs. Um, but the second way, which is, you know, I have all of my values and beliefs and I know what they are and I respect those. And I know you have your own and I respect yours no matter what they are. That is really, really hard to do. And none of us, on, for the most part, are raised that way. So it's the hardest, I think, for any of us to live that way because it's, it's not encouraged all that much out in the world, especially now with what we're dealing with in our culture. Um, anyway, uh, because individual perception is very dangerous to the power structure, it, it, it's not really going to be encouraged by them all that much. And because they all have a vested interest in one size fits all for everybody. I mean, that's just the way that they keep in power and the way that they keep their structures going. Um, I'll tell you this funny story. So when I was growing up, I also uh, was really frustrated by the one size fits all mentality and the that's how it's always been done. I, was, I wasn't totally a rebel, but if you told me not to do something, I would do it just out of spite, even if I didn't want to. You know, even if it was something that was like pointless and, and something that I would never do, I, I deliberately wanted to do it because someone told me not to, right? And then we've all felt a little bit of that sometime. But I, I was remodeling this house once and I went into the bathroom and I'm, I'm about 6'5". I'm, I'm a little over 6'4", almost 6'5". And I wanted the plumber to put the shower head so that it would spray on me here, which meant that if I were standing in the shower, that it would need to come out of the wall pretty high up on that, in that room. And he, the plumber looks at me and he was like, well, you can't have a shower head that high. And I'm like, what do you mean? I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm hiring you to put it there. Um, he was like, well, no one's ever done that. And I'm like, well, okay, I fine. I understand this. But I would like the water to spray on my face, not on my chest. I don't want to have to like go like this. I would rather be able to like, you know, whatever. Then, so he agrees to do it. He agrees to put the shower head where I want. I don't even realize it until after he's finished. He is my height. The plumber is exactly the same height as me. And I'm like, wow, has he gone through his whole life taking showers and it has never occurred to him. He could put his own shower head higher and he never has. And I wonder if it's because he was just okay with that's how it's always been done or he maybe didn't have an opinion about something, my, my hunch is that he didn't really value or have a strong sense of self or an individual perception. He just sort of went along with what everybody else is saying um, and didn't mind it. You know, there's a place for everybody in the world. All of us have a place. And I'm not saying that there's a right way or wrong way to be. I just found it interesting 
that that was the case with this guy who was my height and and almost argued with me about putting the shower head higher. I mean, it's a silly little thing, but it explains so much about everything else. Another instance that I'd like to bring up is I was once called by a storyboard artist who asked if they could uh, do the storyboards for my next movie. And I said no, but uh, then I thought about it. And I thought, you know how interesting, because he doesn't know this, what's going on up here. So if, if I hired him to draw my storyboards, he's going to make his own set of what's happening up here in his head, right? So the, the images that I get back are going to be where he saw the briefcase. Where was the briefcase set down? Maybe I would have pictured it being set down on a table. Maybe I pictured the woman walking over the room, setting down the briefcase on the table. Um, maybe he pictures it being set on the floor. Well, already I'm, I am, there's the option of hiring somebody else to do my storyboards, but then all I'm doing is directing their vision, their perspective. And I found that really intri interesting to me. It was intriguing. And when I hear other filmmakers say, oh, you know, we're, we're about ready to shoot, but I'm waiting on my friend to get me my storyboards or the storyboard artist to X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And I'm, al I'm always fascinated by that because I think that, well, what are they doing then? I mean, sure, you can say you're directing actors, um, but I think that the point of film is the camera and it is the lens because the lens acts as the eyes that are what's going on up here for the filmmaker and I say filmmaker because if it's a producer what's going on up here in the producer's head should be reflected in that lens on the camera and sometimes what's going on up here is the director's sometimes what's going on up here is the investor sometimes what's going on up here is whoever is in charge wherever the buck stops that's where this is coming from and this should be the lens of the camera and not that of the storyboard artist or the DP or the leading actors or whomever. Now, there's always ways to, you know, it's not all black and white. It's, there are grays in between, obviously. So I'm not saying that there's one right way to be and one wrong way to be, obviously. The other thing I want to mention, which I usually start off with and I totally forgot. Um, I hope that some of this information is valuable for you all today. And my advice would be to take what's useful, but leave the rest. You know, if there's some things that you're just, well, I, I can't quite believe that, or I, that's just not useful to me, fine, just throw it away. <laughs> just leave it, leave it behind and take whatever's useful. Hopefully there's some useful things. Now, um, the last part of this is about, it's twofold. It's about taking responsibility for yourself. And most people don't want to do it. It is far easier to blame the other person than it is to take responsibility and say, oh, okay, it's my wrongdoing or it's my mistake or I'm so sorry I messed up. Um, but how you respond to any situation is part of the key to finding your true individual perception. What I'm about to say, when I first say it to some people who've never heard it before, um, find it really hard to wrap their head around, but I will explain if, it, if you don't quite get it. There is no such thing as a problem. That is a fact. There is no such thing as a problem. The only thing that exists that is a truth is your reaction or your response to what someone else would consider a problem. So challenges will happen. You will show up in the morning and you're getting ready to film in the barn and you will discover that the barn has burned down overnight. Okay. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no reason to get angry and throw rocks across the field at the camera crew. <laughs> you know, there's no reason for that. Um, so why bother? I mean, when, when I have a situation like that, I try to solve the situation. I take the challenging situation and I, I figure out a way 
to make it less challenging. So, uh, and no matter what happens in the world, we could have the worst situation, the most violent moment happening in our sphere around us. We could be uh, trapped. We could be, there's all sorts of situations that are terrible. We could also be in something really beautiful and really great and take it for granted because our reaction to it is sort of blasé or something. But the truth is there is no such thing as a problem. There is only your reaction and your response to what other people would consider a problem. And that's the first step is, is learning about your response. Everybody has choices. If you choose to see it a certain way, if I'm like, well, I'm going to decide that what I feel about the world up here is this way. And I try that for a while and it's not working so well. It's not making me very happy. I don't feel very fulfilled. I might, something, it's just not working so well. Instead of sitting in there and, and continuing with this, I can make the choice to choose this over here next. I don't have to live over here all the time. I can choose this and try that out for a while. I might find that I like it better. I might find that I dislike it even more. <laughs> you know, you don't know. So then, it, okay, you can choose again. You can go back to the other thing or you can maybe choose this, you know, choose this, choose. There's so many things you can choose. And when you are faced in a situation of any kind of problem or challenging moment, really be aware of your response to it and your reaction to it. Because once you begin to build, and it sounds like some of you already are, building and have built a pretty good sense of a core self and what is your viewpoint on the world in any given number of subjects, um, once you have that and it's starting to be built and you're really aware of your response to things in the world, then the, the core self and what's going on up here and your envisioned uh, universe inside yourself becomes even stronger and even bigger. Um, so basically, that's all of it in a nutshell. And I know it's a lot of information to unpack. Does anybody have any questions or does anybody want me to go back through and explain anything in particular in more detail? Nobody? <laughs> um, I'm only laughing because I mean I you, I see you guys you're all here I uh, no, I, got it. I thought it would be funny though if I looked up and there was no one there. <laughs> hey Steve, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Steve, hi, it's Nick Brand. Hey. Uh, hey, really appreciate this uh, uh, whole scenario here. What you're covering, I think, is you know, the DNA of uh, what it is you're trying to do or what anybody is trying to do more to get to a more honest DNA. Uh, can you, you talked about some classical, you, some of the classics, the Hitchcocks, the Kubricks and the uh, others. I'm just wondering if you could go back to uh, any, any classic examples of perception that you can find in any of their work that um, that sticks out. You may have covered it. I came in a little late. Um, well, it was basically about um, that even if, I mean, we can go through some, like Kubrick's, here, I'll draw a picture. What's this called? <laughs> Where it's like everything is, you know, um, four point perspective, like it's, it's always this steady cam and the person's always in the middle and there's always just like this big wide thing. Um, center point perspective. Um, there are things like that that each of them do. They all have their tool house, you know, their, their toolkit that they're, they're working on um, or that, that they work through and use all the time. You know, they have their own unique styles and, and they're all sort of very different. Some of them are overlapping. Some of them have similarities. Uh, you, I can tell when I'm watching a film that has been inspired by Bergman because it looks like a Bergman movie. 
<laughs> you know, or something like that. But basically all I was saying was that when I was studying those films in in film school and we went through the scene analysis and did like the overview floor plan and we were we were doing all the shots. Um, I don't know if you if you caught the part about that what we learned was that none of them were doing the best stories. None of them were actually filming the best shots per se. They were just doing it in such a uniquely individual way that that was the key. That that's why they were revered because they were listening to only themselves, not their neighbors, spouses, whoever else to the other person. They're not listening to the other person's perspective. They're only focusing on their own and being true to it. And I will make the tape of me speaking about this available online. So any anybody who missed the beginning part um, can go and see that later. Um, did that help answer your question or do you want me to talk more about that? Uh, no, I think that helped a lot. In fact, I think you can give me a little uh, course correction here. When I'm thinking of perception, I'm thinking of the overall tone tonality of the scene strung together like in a an extremely desperate environment where desperate people exist where it's drabby and post-apocalyptic if you will even though it's not necessarily post-apocalyptic it's just less than perfect there's a tonality there and if you uh, can find then a then moment a moment or moments within that which seem completely counter to that you're are you making a are you introducing an elevated perception or a change in perception related to the overall tone of the scene or scenes that's that's right or is that called something else Stephen? or the, you classify that as a, a, a different topic than what we're dealing with here today i would i would put that in its own own thing. And I think that you said it when you said tonality. I think that there is an overall sort of, um, if you're going to make a dish and you've got these ingredients and the, uh, the goal is to make it this, the result this way, I think that, um, I mean, I could use another sort of analogy. What I'm talking about is the, the perception in yourself, not necessarily the perception of someone else. But, but I think that what you're talking about is something else. I, it, I, it's not quite, I don't know how perception would, would totally fit into that other than there would be a lot of perceptions at work <laughs> in that situation. So for instance, um, it's, it's a pretty radical thing to say that film is not a collaborative art, but it is certainly a collaborative process. So the person who's building the canvas and stretching the canvas and building the frame could be a totally different person than who's mixing the colors and the people who are building, making the brush. But it requires each one of those things. You know, it's like if you if you look at a camera crew or a film crew or a lighting crew, grip, grip crew, actors, makeup, hair, uh, art department, um, special effects, all that costume, go on and on and on. All of those places and all, all of those uh, people involved have their own unique individual perception that will influence the overall work. And if, and that's why, you know, certain DPs are hired because they uh, work in this way, or I'm going to hire this costumer because they really understand colors in the way that I see in my mind, the colors for this film. Now, if, if, if I if it's if it's my project and I'm the producer and the director and I'm deciding those things, then I can be you know making sure that all of the people involved are the right people for the job. But if I'm just the hired director, I mean in one case I was hired to direct this movie, uh, and the production company said, well here are your three choices, you know for this position pick the one you like. And I'm like, well, yeah, but if this is all I have to choose from, then I'll pick this, but none of them really have what I think it will take, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's a whole different thing. Um, I think that it would be fun though, to have another workshop at some point, or just even a Q and A 
about that very thing that you're talking about, which is sort of like if you look at a Tarkovsky movie and it feels a certain way, it certainly has a texture to it. I mean, you could even taste it. Like it, it, I can imagine it tasting a certain way. And if I go and I watch um, any one of Kubrick's, it tastes totally different, but I, I get that it has its own unique thing too. But I think that, again, that just comes back to all of those creators, the people who were responsible for taking their vision and their, their art and presenting it to the world were listening to their inner self. They weren't listening to other people. They might be bringing other people in to facilitate this, if that makes sense. All of these people that they're working with on this project have all of their own viewpoints for sure, and they can all be respected and included. But I think that by bringing them all in, their primary purpose is to serve the self-core individual viewpoint of the person who is creating the project, whether that's, you know, the creative producer who's hired the director, or if it's the director who's written it and is putting it together himself or herself. Um, does that help flesh that out a little bit more? So thereby the, so yeah, absolutely. If I, I caught, I remember I'm the guy that always lowers the curve. Uh, but what I was able to get was that the way you've, you set up a scene, the activity within that scene, the overall construction, lighting, and shot of the scene is in fact the message you want to send at that moment that is your perception of that well, scene. I think that, is, that, is that, am I getting anywhere close to that? That's, that's closer, but I think that you've, you've decided that ahead of time. When I sit down and I'm, I, have directed my most recent, I haven't directed a feature that I've been in charge of in years. And I am so happy because I, in the fall I did, and we're in post now. And when I, I just, I had forgotten how I used to do it because it had been so long, but I, uh, I storyboarded everything. I mean, I had co-written it with someone. So it, it came out from this space up here to begin with. And I storyboarded the whole thing. And I sat down with my DP and um, I just saw somebody say, may I comment? Uh, one sec. Um, but yes, uh, anybody can, for sure. Um, this is, I, am, I, I forgot to say, we're now open into Q&A, so anybody can comment and we can have an exchange now about stuff. Uh, but so I sat with my DP and we're like, okay, here's what the, intent, the intention is. You know, here's what we're gonna go for. Here's my color scheme, my color palette. I want um, her to be always lit warmly and I want him to not be lit at all. I want him to be cold and when he comes into her environment, he can be lit by her reflection and when he walks away and the camera goes back, it becomes cold again because all the warmth has gone out of the shot. And so all of that kind of stuff was up here in my part, in my head and it didn't come from him but it required him to, when we got on set, to make sure it was lit correctly and that his crew had made it look the way that I wanted it to look. And because I had done you know, storyboards and we had a look book, we had examples, all of those types of things were previously decided. Um, and I think that if the director is doing that with the DP and you trust each other and, you, and you've worked together before, I mean, this, my, my DP I've worked with many times and I, I we're, synced. He knows exactly what I mean when I say something or when I'm trying to describe something, which is very, very lucky. Um, I have worked with people sometimes where they haven't quite gotten it. And when you get to the set, you're like, oh, that's not quite what I had in mind at all. But you just, again, there's no such thing as a challenge or no such thing as a problem. You just deal with it. Um, so yeah, when you're building the set, when you're building the, the look, the mise-en-scene, and you're unspooling the story and uh, all of those elements are important and all of them come out of 
what it is that you envision. And if you, if you don't have the power to envision something, then I would say, try to work on that first, because that's the most important thing. If, if you as a director or creator or writer, or whatever, um, singer songwriter could be a restaurateur, could be a cook, whatever it is. If you are looking to the other person, the school, the neighbor, your spouse to tell you how to see something or how you should do something, then I don't think you should be a director yet. Yet. I think that you can learn how to do it. You nailed it. That, that, that's uh, Stephen. That is exactly what I was trying to say. Wow. That's a, yeah, that's okay. Cool. That is what I was hoping you would say. And, uh, I think I get it. I think I get it. I think I get what you're I think I get it a little bit here. Okay. Appreciate it. And 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 also if somebody doesn't have the ability yet because maybe they're they're not so confident or maybe they don't they're a little uncertain, maybe they were always raised with, "Oh, your ideas suck." Or what do you, you know, it's like I've had friends who have struggled with that a lot because their parents were not supportive and they said, "Oh, oh, you wrote that song? Uh, I think you should try again or maybe you should find a a real job, you know, and I'm just like, wow, you couldn't, you have just said, Oh, cool song. <laughs> you know, like it amazes me, but maybe they, they have such a hard time coming out with what their inner true core perception wants that they've sort of shut it off, but it's possible to get it back. Um, I recently at the beginning of last month, I listened to an audio book called a new earth that was written by Eckhart Tolle. And I realize I'm probably a little late in the game getting there because it came out a number of years ago um, or just a few years ago. But it is unbelievably helpful. And if anybody has ever had any trouble trying to find, uh, especially if they've got some PTSD or some like some trauma, some history of trauma, um, I think it helps open up a lot to allow and embrace who is inside here. Who who am I? Who is who is my, who, you know? all that, the, your, your sense of being, which once you unlock your sense of being and just who you are, then your confidence builds, uh, you're more apt to take, uh, you know, explore and investigate. Uh, I was gonna say take risks, but I don't even think they're risks anymore. I think that they're just cool investigations or cool explorations. Um, and once you start living that way, I think that then just the natural insight that you have of the world itself around you and what, how you feel, uh, helps so that you become stronger and that you have then a much better, a, 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 a way you've almost given yourself permission to have an opinion to have, well, I think the camera should be here. You know, it's like, I, I envision it coming from over here. And if your lead actor says, no, I don't think, I think you should shoot me on the other side because I look better or no, I think you should come over it from this way. What I often do in situations like that, by the way, is especially now because there's digital. It was a lot more expensive to do when it was film. My first two movies were shot on 35, so I would not have practiced this then. Um, but I didn't learn about it then. I learned about it later. When an actor insists, especially if they've got a very healthy ego and they, they have a name, you know, they're famous, whatever, and they insist that you film them this way. I mean, if they're super huge, you know, if it's Barbara Streisand, you're filming it the way that she's going to make you film it, <laughs> is what I've heard. Um, so I don't know if I'd cast her, but uh, I was working with this actor once, and a um, famous guy, and he said, you need to shoot me over this way. And I said to myself, it will take me less time to just shoot it his way and also my way than it will for me to try to argue with him and try to make him understand what I'm going for because his perception is his. Mine is mine. I didn't like his idea. It, it didn't fit into my realm of perception uh, for this particular project. So what did so, you do? Did you pan around? Did you pan him from side to side to make sure? No, here's, here's, here, no, here's what I did. Here's, no, here's what I did. I said, 
Oh, interesting idea. How about we shoot it my way, then we shoot it your way, and then let's shoot it a third way that we just sort of improv it and see what happens. And because I flew that one in at the end, it sort of disguised the fact that we were gonna do it my way also, <laughs> which meant that I would just use my version in the edit. <laughs> I, I like that. That's the we're not worthy close. I love that. Yes. <laughs> You're the boss, totally. my friend. Yes. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention, which isn't totally unrelated, or maybe it is totally related, actually. Jane Weedlin, who is the uh, bassist and songwriter for the Go-Go's, um, she is a friend of mine, and she once told me her advice on receiving feedback receiving notes and even though we sort of discussed that it's pointless because since no two people see the same thing the same way nobody should be providing them <laughs> you know nobody should be offering feedback or notes to begin with but if they do and you're in the early process you're editing you're in a in a place where uh you're still putting it together you're still making the dish um the first thing she does is she looks at the list of notes and she reads the note and she asks herself, does that fit in my model of this universe? If the answer is no, she just goes to the next note. Shouldn't think about it. Shouldn't hesitate. She doesn't ask, well, how could they think that? She just asks the question, does this fit in my model of the world? If the answer is no, she goes to the next one. She reads that note. She asks the question again. Does that fit in my model of the world? If the answer is yes, she has a subsequent question, which is, if I implement this, will people think I'm a genius? And I love that. I mean, she's you know being funny and whatever, but the, it's the truth. So if it already fits in here, you know, and if you implemented it, if it makes the project better is what she's saying, or if it if it takes it to the next step, then maybe you should just include it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't though, if the answer to that question is, if I implement this, will it make a difference? If the answer is no, well then it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you do it or not, it doesn't matter. Um, but that also gives it sort of an arm's length distance, you know, when you're receiving notes to look at it that way, especially if you really truly respect and believe that the other person has their own sets of values and their own perception. And they've grown up a certain way, they have their own uh, background, they have whatever's surrounding them. And if you respect that, no matter what it is, they could be a total jerk. But if you just respect that they have their own baggage and their own history, then whatever notes you're getting, always focus right back inside yourself and say, does this fit with my model? And that's it. Um, does anybody else have? Yeah. Okay. May I? Please. Cool. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you, Mr. Steve. You know, I got to tell you, this is such a wonderful opportunity to actually speak to somebody who makes movies rather than all of us commoners who just speak as if we did know him what a movie is. So thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to go back to your, your idea of perception and everything. And I don't want to say this is a criticism. So I wouldn't just say this is something to add. This is just something to add, you know? So, um, well, I, agree or, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying, that everyone's perception is brought up by their life experience, so everybody views everything according to that. And as a psychologist, we're all aware of biases and everything, so we know that. And the thing is, what we used to do is assess ourselves before we even see a patient. So we're well aware of this. But the great thing about um, a lot of movies is, is that even if we see something, I think we could also say we kind of don't like it, not just because if it doesn't fit the experience, because I think there is also a common shared experience. Like if I tell you, hey, Steve, let's get together and watch a film noir. You already know what the set objectives are for the film noir. Like way back in 82, when Ridley Scott came out with Blade Runner, it brought out so many discussions like, is this a film noir movie? Is this a science fiction movie? We brought out so many discussions from me and my friends. 
And then last year, more recently, we saw Joker and we couldn't get a grasp on it because we were like, watch it as an outside observer. Now watch it as a Joker. Well, now watch it as a mental health professional. And we keep getting different perspectives. And then yeah. I thought, that's what makes it wonderful. That's what makes it unique. Because so many times, I'm 51 now, I've watched movies where they have a standard beginning, middle, and end, or everything is cutthroat, you know, straight lace up to me, you know, everything is all fixed. We know what's getting in. Like, there was a point even in the 80s when I was growing up, we watch all these action movies, and if there's a car chase in the sequence in that movie in the 80s, you know there's going to be a guy with a hot dog stand, and they're going to crash in that hot dog stand. You know, right. all this stuff, you know, it's always going to happen. And then all of a sudden, you see these movies that break the convention. Like, all of a sudden, in 79, and when Alien came out, it wasn't a big, brutal man who was the hero. It was a young female, you know, Sigourney Weaver. They were breaking the convention, the science fiction and horror. And suddenly right. you realize you kind of have to know the shared experiences to know what's great. So I thought that ambiguity, whether it's Blade Runner or whether it's even Joker, is what makes it great because you can see multiple perspectives. And all of us kind of know that in a way, even back when we were in school, when our teacher said, hey, read this novel or something and tell me why it's classic. And then the teacher says, tell me what this novel is about. And they get like seven different perceptions of what it is. And you realize that's why it's a classic because right. there's so many different perceptions. So I was just wanted to mention that maybe when you watch a David Lynch movie and you're like, what the heck is the story on Mulholland Drive? That's the whole point. Is that right. part of a dream? Is that not a dream? And you're like, that's why it was so amazing because of the ambiguity, because there's so many different perceptions. You know, everybody, some of us like, you know, you watch a great movie and you're like, oh, you could only see that once. But then if you watch a Lynch movie or Joker, how many times can you watch a movie and say, there's so many different perspectives, I could forever enjoy this movie. So right. I think in some ways, the fact that you can create something that has multiple perspectives in it is what makes it such a masterpiece. And is why us viewers and us fans love it so much, because we can get so many different things. From your knowledge and your background, I'm sure if you watch Citizen Kane, you can see ad infinite amount of stuff that I could. And you will always love those movies. So I think it's because the fact that we can maybe make different perspectives is why we appreciate it so much. Well, totally, completely. And sometimes it is fun to play with what is conventionally thought of as, you know, we're supposed to do it this way or, or that way. But there's also a huge difference. And my primary focus is independent film. I think that when you get into the bigger budget studio movies or any sort of like production company that's that's making films, you know, north of 10 or 15 million dollars. It's I think that there is a whole set of belief systems and structures and ways to go about things that are going to be very very different than what I primarily like to talk about. Um but you know, it's also so different today than it was in you know, you could you could have you know, you could be Easy Rider and make a film that is technically independent that becomes a commercial success, and that still does happen, but the, the general movie-going audience uh, isn't so interested in films like that as much as they used to, and I think that that's just a, a cultural change. Um, I think it probably takes a very, very strong-willed or powerful set of people to make a movie like Joker and actually get it made. You know, it's like uh, the, the people who have the, the courage to actually say yes to that movie and fund it. Um, okay, so for right now, everybody who's listening, let's make Steve CEO of a film company. <laughs> right. Um, we'll see. <laughs> That's all I'm saying about that. Thank you, Steve. Um, Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, well, we only have a few more minutes. I w wanted to, uh, again, welcome those of you who came late. And this was the, the first time that I've hosted any sort of like thing like this 
through this meetup, which we just started. And uh, later this week, we have a couple of other, uh, a lecture from a special effects makeup artist who primarily is his, he has a guide that is made for producers and directors and his process by working with them when you're handling the budget and the scheduling from the get-go. If you have a project that requires special effects makeup or any kind of thing like that, then it's really, I would tune into that. That's on Friday. Um, and on Wednesday, I'm having a Q&A with a director friend who, uh, it's about talking versus doing. And it was, it was one of those things where he just woke up one day and was tired of talking and decided to make a movie with his friend in his living room by happenstance. And then that movie went on to win a number of awards at festivals. And then his first feature starred Paul Reiser and Molly Shannon. And it's a pretty cool story. So we're doing a Q&A with him on Wednesday. And then I have a seminar, uh, which you'll need to book a ticket to, uh, called How to Find Investors. For any of you who want to know how to do it, I know exactly how to do it. I know I have identified the five types of investors over the course of 20 years of 22, three, four years of doing this. I know how to find them. I know how to gain rapport with them. I know who they are and where to get them. And I'm going to tell you about them. And that is on the 27th, which is a week from next Saturday, two weeks from today. It's so interesting how time feels these days, I tell you. Um, okay, so does anybody have anything else before we go? Thank you, Jake. Um, I will make this tape available on my website in a day or so, not right away, because I have to download it and all that shit. But uh, I will make it available so that if anybody wants to revisit this as a resource later on, it'll be there. Thank you all very much for participating and for being here. And please stay safe and stay healthy and take care of each other. And let's work on all of our own individual perspectives and perceptions and help the world get better. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.